Welcome to tonight's reading. This is the last in the spring series of the Readings in Contemporary Poetry. So we welcome you on this rainy evening. Um, the series is co-curated by Vincent Katz and Jasmine Raymond, the curator at DIA. And it, it really extends from a lineage of poetry readings that DIA has been holding for almost two decades. The series currently is supported in part with funds from the New York City Public, I'm sorry, New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, as well as anonymous donor, and Amalia Dian and Adam Lindemann, uh, as well as Barbara and Charles Wright. We also thank Brooklyn Brewery, of course, for the beer and the beverages. And finally, I would like to thank the poets, Jerome Sala and Elaine Equi, for being here tonight and being a part of this wonderful series. I'd also like to thank the staff at DIA, Patrick Heilman, who helps in all of the media and technical coordination, as well as John Sprague, Sarah Zielinski, and Rebecca Rice. It is now my pleasure to introduce Vincent Katz, who will introduce tonight's series. Thanks so much. Greetings, and thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, so yeah, the way this will work tonight is that Jerome Sala will read first. We'll have a short break, five minutes, let's say, and then Elaine Equi will read. It is a pleasure to introduce Elaine Equi and Jerome Sala, and it is perfect that their reading is the grand finale to this season of readings. The series features pairings based on relationships, usually intergenerational, but the last reading before this one, Alan Gilbert, and Paul Chan was based not on generation, but on collaboration. Today, we present that rare, but not entirely, entirely unheard of phenomenon, the poet couple. Two poets living together, sharing writing, thinking, reading. It must be a rich and rarefied environment. Except, with what we know of these two, it must also be hilarious much of the time. Elaine Equi and Jerome Sala are certainly two of the wittiest poets writing today. They are both completely of their time, and yet we are witnessing, too, how they are both beyond time, instant classics. I have to add a personal note about how we met. It was the first time I organized a reading for these two in 1980 or 81 at University of Chicago. I got in touch with them and invited them to read, and they, Jerome, I think, wrote or maybe telephoned back to say that they would be delighted to read and wanted to build their reading as two virgins, which we did. Jerome set small candles around the floor and caught his kilt on fire. <coughs> Suffice it to say, it was a memorable evening. To give a little of the tenor of the times and the world out of which Jerome and Elaine were coming, I'd like to read a couple of short sections from an interview I did with Jerome. Here is Jerome speaking. After I got out of college, the age of punk began. I hung out on that scene and started performing work in the back of punk clubs. My style got a lot more performative. Mayakovsky became a big influence then, along with anti-poets like Nicanor Para, also crazy manifesto-type tones. Marinetti's Futurist Manifesto, as well as funny pieces like Down with the Tango. At first, there, were no, there was no literary context for this new style. Then I met Elaine Equi, who was also influenced by punk, and we began performing together. This started an early performance poetry scene in Chicago. When Elaine and I started doing events together, my style came more or less into its own. Direct, pop, with elements of parody, and, I hoped, social satire. Early on, I did get dubbed a punk poet. I used to recite my poems in the back of the first punk disco, Chicago's La Mer Vipere on Halstead Street. Like at a punk concert, I'd taunt the audience and they'd reciprocate. Lit cigarettes would fly back and forth between the crowd and the stage, along with insults. But it was all in fun. And doing readings like this, you could get away with wearing outlandish get-ups and hairstyles. Jerome Sala was born in Evergreen Park, Illinois in 1951 and grew up in Chicago, quote, in a neighborhood known as Little Village near the Cook County Jail, a gangbanger's neighborhood, as he puts it, lots and lots of gang activity. 
Sala is fascinated by modes of discourse. Quote, poetry doesn't swear enough, he says. There are still walls of propriety that need to be broken down, and allowing this language from my background to come forth helps me work toward this, I hope. Sala is the author of many cult classics, including Spaz Attack, I Am Not a Juvenile Delinquent, The Trip, Raw Deal, Look Slimmer Instantly, and most recently, Prom Night from 2011, a collaboration with artist Tamara Gonzalez featuring a sequence of Sala's goth horror poems. He has a PhD in American Studies from NYU and has worked for ad agencies as a copywriter and creative director, which has influenced his more recent poetry. He maintains the blog Espresso Bongo at espressobongo.typepad.com and lives and works in New York City. In an early poem, The Great, Sala wrote, I hate the great. They prattle on and on with their admirable deeds, words, thoughts, aphorisms, till there's no room left for any of us." End quote. He often has the pretentious and abusive in his crosshairs, but he is quick to be self-deprecating as well, as in the poem that begins, quote, I'm the type of guy who just wastes $5.95 on the wrong book, then sentences himself to read it from cover to cover. <laughs> quote. One of his most beautiful poems is for John Lennon, in which he is able to balance admiration, realism, despair and anger, quote, you were clumsy like we are when we try too hard to be cool, quote. Turning to the poems in Sala's most recent collection, Look Slimmer Instantly, in the poem On Pain and Gain, he attacks greed in a generalized way, almost as a moralist writing about the seven sins, while in, quote, On Money and Bullshit, he even seems to include himself as susceptible to moral weakness. In the poem God Bless America, he goes for a direct hit on the USA, making clear his belief that the US is the ringleader in fomenting the moral crises he alludes to in other poems. Please welcome the entertaining, elegant, street smart, classic poet, Jerome Sala. Thanks, Vincent, and for such a great introduction. Thanks, Dia, for having the two of us together. Um, my style since then has changed completely, so uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, uh, no longer wild whatsoever. I've been, I've been tamed. But um, first thing I want to read, since I'm reading with, uh, with Elaine, and we used to read together all the time, as Vincent's uh, introduction said, you know, suggests. Uh, but we haven't gotten to read together, especially in New York, in a really long time. We just read together in Chicago a few months ago. It was really fun. Um, so I wanted to read something that's that kind of at least mildly collaborative. And um, Elaine did this website uh, called The Holiday Album. And the idea behind this was, in the poetry world, supposedly, the worst possible poetry that could ever be written is uh, greeting card verse. So of course, what Elaine did is she solicited all sorts of poets all across the country to read, write greeting card verse about their favorite holidays. <clears throat> so kind of writing against the cliche. So here's my uh, greeting card verse, and um, my holiday is Mother's Day. Mother's Day, dear mom, when God handed out the Oedipus complex, he didn't give me one. <laughs> you are so hot. With love, your son, Blind Lemon Jefferson. <laughs> Kisses. Uh, Next two poems are uh, kind of my interpretation of uh, the economy of the last uh, five years. <clears throat> First one's a cartoon poem, and it's, it's, uh, the image is one of those cartoons where the, the, mouse is, uh, the mouse is chased by the cat, and the mouse runs off a cliff, and the cat chases that mouse off the cliff, 
uh, and they're, they're like chasing each other in midair until they look down. And that reminded me of uh, the kind of uh, craze of speculation, all these stocks and bonds uh, which are supposed to be worth so much money until people look down. And I found out recently that uh, this, the philosopher Slavoj Žižek, when he was speaking at Occupy Wall Street, he used the same analogy uh, of, only he used uh, the image of uh, Wile E. Coyote. So I guess uh, there's a lot of cartoons where uh, animals are running in midair. Later, comma, cliff. Cliff is something you fall off of. When I was a mouse in a cartoon chased by a cat, I said, later, Cliff, as I ran into midair. But the cat followed me out into the mighty void of, I thought, escape. And we stayed there above the infinite drop, feet and paws peddling, long and short noses gasping, tails whipping into the great cool nothingness, perpetual popular machines until we look down. Uh, next one is called uh, The Sole Purpose. And this, this poem, I like work in a corporation. And everything you do, I'm like in the creative department, like promotion. But everything you do is figured into this vast spreadsheet. Every, every little moment you spend is, is tabulated into these giant spreadsheets. And, and I realized that that seemed like the basis of reality is really this spreadsheet. Um, and I was like looking at these spreadsheets and they reminded me of apartment buildings as if we're all kind of living in, um, you know, in a little apartment flat in the middle of a spreadsheet. The sole purpose. The sole purpose of the dream is to hide its dreaminess. That day at the spreadsheet, the marketing manager created a great work of realist art. A trompe d'oeil. Oh, sorry. She constructed her figures, a trompe d'oeil of the first magnitude. As a bird once tried to eat a grape in a painting, and pierce the cheap canvas with its beak. So we, speculative numbers, gazing from our apartments within the grid, enjoyed the delusion that we could dance in the forest of those equations, nakedly exposing our values to one another, a witch's Sabbath of pure profit, and even better, a prophecy of more music to come, notes that glow like the integers, the intoxicated insist, stitch our lonely cosmos together. A um, couple of poems here, uh, also big uh, inspiration to me are movies and television. And um, this poem is called, It's Not TV, which is the slogan of HBO. It, it's not TV, it's HBO. Um, and it's, it's uh, this, this show, The Game of Thrones, and, and this is my memory of the last scene of the uh, first uh, season, when the, this barbarian queen walks into a funeral pyre following her, her dead husband's body. It's not TV. Khaleesi, queen of the barbarians, joins her husband on the funeral pyre. Before walking in, she says to her devotees, I am the daughter of the dragon. If anyone harms you, they'll die screaming. The witch who betrayed her is tied to the pyre too. She says, I won't scream. Khaleesi, yes you will, but I don't want your screams, just your life. When the branches have burned and all the agonizing screams have been screamed, Khaleesi is still kneeling there, unharmed, naked, except for some ashes where her clothes have burned off. The dragon eggs thrown into the fire with her have hatched. A baby dragon sits on each shoulder. In the book, one is nursing at her breast. Um, in this corporation I work, the, one of the financial guys is a total uh, Game of Thrones freak. And I said, did you see the last scene of the first, uh, you know, the first season? He goes, yeah, but in, in the book, 
the dragon's actually nursing at her breast. It was more awesome. <laughs> Not TV, man. <laughs> um, this is that movie Idiocracy, which everybody I know who's seen it says this is the map of our lives. Uh, it's it's uh, set in the future where uh, people keep growing stupider and stupider. Um, people are cast into the future where people are so dumb they can hardly uh, speak to each other. After seeing Idiocracy, I was idiot for a day in my own idiocracy. There the planet shook under the strain of dumbness. It forgot how to turn on its taxis, the axis. It thought the whole idea of an axis was just weird. We all flew off into space. Space was dumb too. It forgot the law of gravity. We landed back on the dumb earth. We had to talk sea spot run type language to trees just to convince them to grow. When they grew, they said, thanks, dumb people. But by then, we could no longer understand them. We were too stoned on Gatorade. It's got electrolytes. Uh, this is, this is a, another television poem, but, but Elaine had this project where she was uh, photographing scenes from uh, B-class uh, horror and fantasy movies on TV, and then she collected these photos and, and wrote poems about them. And um, in this, in this uh, particular poem, uh, I, I, was sitting, I was sitting at the kitchen table, and I heard the click, and what was on TV was uh, the old Gulliver's Travels, the Ray, Ray Harryhausen uh, special effects one. And so this kind of came to me. The s snow day. The camera in the other room points and clicks a photo of Gulliver as he travels along the television screen through an 18th century made charming by the special effects of the great Ray Harryhausen. A twinkly music peeps through the door as if to offer a personal hello by way of its friendly familiarity. I think memory was considered the ultimate muse because it turned, it turned even the ancients on to the charms of the retro. Inspired this way, they could get busy inventing the Neo, where all that was got to return, only in a better, shinier form, as if, light, as if the light of the present sun, as if the light of the present sun released the once was from, the, from its past duties, even the seeming obligation to a tragically limited duration. Um, this one I was thinking of uh, years ago, Randy Newman wrote this song about short people that everyone got outraged about. So I thought, why not write a poem about tall people? The tall. The imposing quality of tall people, used to getting their way, they tend to insist. Imagine a whole day ordering around others, a manager in the restaurant of a novel, that offers a panoramic view of American life. I'm at its page when the tall author begins a major offensive to conquer contemporary opinion. By the end of this sec sec section, if successful, innocent readers like myself will begin to buy into the realism of the fiction, even more so because of the winks and nudges that hover over the text to let you know that you know what you think you know, that you're holding a book, and also that it defends our civilization. Um, for many years, I, would, I meditate in the morning, and people would say, you must have so much discipline. But I always say, well, if you felt as bad as I did do when I wake up, I think you would do the same thing. So I try to capture a little bit of uh, how I feel in the morning. This is called In the Bathroom. In the bathroom, that place where the wounded self applies its unguents, its salves, its deodorants, soaps, gels, reassembling the daily mind-body armor, ready for love or war, 
despite the roar of the rocky waterfalls of inner experience, the boiling ice cubes of anxiety. In the bathroom, in the mirror, Freddy Krueger waves goodbye <laughs> from the dreams one has just escaped, only to be replaced by the business-like hockey mask of Michael Myers that seems to hide a smirk as it welcomes you again into the slashing light of the daily trauma, or as Borges put it more simply, the weight of dawn. In the bathroom, the silver water dancing like mercury unleashed from a mad thermometer. The thirsty drains rasping as they devour the skin's residues. The waste products entering the maelstrom of a porcelain whirlpool. All that's left is the descent into the streets where the ways of nature are not our ways, nor are the ways of the market's demolition derby. Uh, this, this one's called Urban Warrior. When I was uh, doing grad, graduate work uh, in American studies, which is like cultural studies, a really popular type of scholarship is uh, ethnographic study of, of kind of unknown urban subcultures. Uh, which scholars would mine for all the magic they found in them. So I was thinking about this, uh, and I wrote this thing. Urban Warrior. Legend has it, beneath the surface of the money self, there's something richer. Once it gets out, it turns you funky. You wear the colors of the parrots and amuse the beasts with your talk. Statisticians declare there's more to you than they thought. In their studies, they imagine the ancient emerge, a lost civilization from under the streets, one now dressed in the slang of the future. A, a surprise provoked by the forgotten, exciting like an uncounted roll of bills, a locked suitcase rattling with diamonds, the flag of an unknown country whose emblem has not yet been deciphered. Um, and then I uh, wanted to read some poems. Vin in this interview Vincent mentioned, we got to talking about politics and poetry. And, um, and you know, uh, do they mix? And, uh, you know, a lot of people think they don't mix because it makes poems didactic or something like that. But what we were talking about is, is um, there's a lot of aesthetic beauty to politics, like its language, its uh, imagery, it's sort of exciting, exciting aesthetically. So I thought poems that play with the aesthetics of politics would be fun. So this is, this is a couple of those. Uh, this one's called The Strange Violent Life of Brands, and uh, the brand here is the president. Has Coke aged? If a brand does not exist, how can it grow old? Is Pepsi still young for the young? Will it go the way of Pepsodent? Or will, it, will its memorials grow distinguished like a presidential candidate can look? Black shiny hair, silver temples, after he's been branded with the I am a potential president logo. Presidents do not exist as persons in themselves, but as other beings from strange, opaque dimensions. You'd need to be an astrophysicist with a minor in quantum mechanics and be able to write thrilling science fiction to know the path of particles from which they arose. And even then, you'd only see momentary traces in the thick circular soup racing through the tunnels of a super collider. They appear, it's rumored, whenever they smash into the images thrown off by the opposition and explode. I was once elected class president, and it embarrassed me. I didn't want the duty, and now I can see why. But others, who I barely knew, seemed compelled to vote for me. Um, this one's called uh, Portrait of the General, and I was reading this uh, Roberto Bolaño's book, Nazi Writers in the Americas. It's a really funny book um, where he makes up all of these f portraits of writers who never existed. And I think it must have rubbed off on me because I was thinking of, uh, it would be fun to write a portrait of a, like a 
really militant general who, you know, in times of crisis, everyone looks up to these figures. Portrait of the general. Once a member of violent street gangs, later served as top piranha in his subtropical think tank. Now he exists, neither happily nor un, as the periodical, perhaps, in the state's vast mind. He is a momentary doubt, a glitch in the political logic, just enough to cause a hesitation about upping the ante in the game of national terror. A guy like him, he could look a cattle prod in the prongs without the least shudder in his nether regions. He was so bad we could trust him to do the right thing or at least something. A grim grin along his ruthless robot jaw and even the youth of our glorious truth brigade would develop bladder control problems. Our confused quote unquote elected officials whimpered for the favors of their quote unquote dear general for morsels of his militant wisdom. Even if to be in his debt meant that they had to leave their representational fantasies behind and assume a place on the placid walls of history's museum, abstract expressions of a vanishing empire. The general, though, would usually smother such cries with his gargantuan deaf ears. In the vacuum of his unhearing, our senators would swirl, arguing like intoxicated gnats. Meanwhile, the earth would quiver under his shoes, vast as the Himalayas, and the sky itself, intimidated by the steely technology of his thoughts, would prepare its cloud beds for his stealthy exploration. And the last one I want to read is a prose poem, so it'll sound a little prosier. Um, you know, politics is either the art of the possible, the science of the possible, something. Um, and, and this is just uh, called the possibility junkies, drunk on the ecstasy of politics. The modest were overthrown that day by the vulgar, but this was a little like Athens. Everybody got a turn. The vulgar were then replaced by the anxious, who, while often vulgar themselves, were so nervous about it that they were often forgiven. The forgivers came next, and people loved them for a while. But as they grew familiar, the old scorn came back. They were judged by many to be phonies. Who, after all, could forgive everyone? I mean, quotes, if someone flayed every me single member of your family alive, unquotes. Oops, bad example. Others just saw them as soft, like a European basketball player who's great at scoring in the NBA but can't play defense. They were replaced by the militarists who forgive no one who were replaced by the hedonists, for whom such things weren't an issue. Then came the ascetics. Happiness comes by way of sometimes kinky versions of discipline. The esthetes, and then their second cousins, the cosmeticians. Onward the parties rolled, a profusion of political feathers and weathers, and the days were filled with the ecstasy of the political. Possibilities blooming at a faster and faster pace, until every split second a new promise of change erupted. And before you knew it, once every century or go, once every century or so, something actually occurred. Thank you. started again, and now it's my great pleasure to introduce Elaine Equi. <laughs> Elaine Equi was born in Oak Park, Illinois Take in 1953. Break, yeah. She's the author of many collections of poetry, including Views Without Rooms, Surface Tension, Voice Over, which won the San Francisco State Poetry Award, Decoy, Ripple Effect, New and Selected Poems, which was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Award and on the shortlist for the Griffin Poetry Prize. And most recently, Click and Clone from 2011, and most of those books have been published by Coffeehouse Press. Widely published and anthologized, Elaine Equi lives in New York City where she teaches creative writing at NYU and in the MFA programs at the New School and City College. 
Elaine Equi is a master of innuendo, or is it mistress? She is always calling into question titles, roles, in daily life, dreams, in domestic relations, and in sexual relations. But she calls them into question with such wit and candor that we would never say she deals with issues in her poems. Rather, she finds locutions stimulating in themselves that have wit built into them, then proceeds seemingly to fool around with them, amusing herself, until, like a wizard, bang, she comes up with a heady concoction. High culture is just as likely as low to be the content, but we get the feeling that Equi prefers it when her content is a little down at the heels. Melancholy traipses through her poems, but so do gentleness, awareness, and surprise. She's equally the master of the found and almost found poems, like Things to Do in the Bible and Post Sonnet, in which every line is a New York Post headline and poems that she chisels out of simultaneously her perfectly pitched word bank and the quirky details of daily life. Many of her poems are hilarious without losing their balance. Most surprising then, but why should they be, are her sweet domestic poems addressed to or about her husband. Breakfast with Jerome, Jerome meditating, but also both of us writing, quote, me in bed, and you at the table, both of us writing, these rooms, this experience, our marriage, the corridor between. I present to you the indefinably fantastic Elaine Equi. Thank you so much, all of you, for coming. It blows my mind that you're all here. I can't believe that you came out tonight. Um, I'm very excited. Thank you, Vincent, for having me read with my favorite poet, Jerome Sala. So sweet. Oh. <laughs> um, and I, actually, I do think there's, some, there's something special, um, if you like either of our poems, that happens when, when you hear our work together. Um, I do think that the best way to appreciate it is kind of in a, in a conversation because that's the way, in fact, that it got written, as Vincent said. So I'm going to start with some poems from Click and Clone, um, just a few, and then I'm going to read mostly new work tonight. And I couldn't figure out what to read from Click and Clone. Um, some of you know that I like short poems and minimalism, so I thought I would read all the really short one and two line poems from Click and Clone. The first one is called, Hurry the Fuck Up. <laughs> Come on, you can walk a mile in 15 minutes one-legged. Now get going. <laughs> Amidst a froth of ferns, three shrunken heads planted in a window box. They go quick. <laughs> <laughs> Led Zeppelin revision. That stairway only leads halfway to heaven. <laughs> Flute girl, every symposium needs at least one. <laughs> Obad, late in the day. An Obad is a, a poem in honor of the dawn, and I don't like to get up early, so my Obad is late in the day. And this is dedicated to Tom Gunn. The boy gleamed. Oh, tall, well-dressed, young buildings. Does he live here among you? A Bing Cherry mash note. Black juice, the first of summer, from fruit made fruitful in the mouth engine. Orange and brown destination. Like sitting in air-conditioned fire, antlers sprout from glowing walls. OK, so these are the new ones now. But um, there's a continued interest in compression and distillation. So this one is called, If I Have Just One Word. It really should be a one-word poem, but it's not. 
If I have just one word, well, still, that's a lot of possibility. A word can be a shriek or a chrysanthemum, barbed or honeyed, or maybe one of those nonchalant writerly words, a preposition, pronoun, conjunction on its way to the soiree of a paragraph. Something to say, there's plenty more where that came from. This is very exciting. It's my first ever bilingual poem, Spanish and English. It's called Yo y Tu. I don't know a lot of Spanish, so that's the extent of my Spanish. In Spanish, yo means I, and tu is a you I know, or at least am comfortable addressing casually. In English, we have no informal form to indicate the you still in pajamas, hair wild, drinking coffee, intimacy, friendship, easy access. In English, the informal you is yo. <laughs> so uh, this poem is called In Search of the Lost Diminutive. And uh, diminutive is a, a suffix. It's like an ending you tack at the, at the end of the word. And it makes it into like a, a miniature version of itself. Um, but it's not just a, a miniature version of itself. It's sort of like a friendlier, nicer version of itself. It's very common like in uh, Spanish or Italian or French. We have it in English, but not too much. The example I found was kitchenette instead of kitchen, which doesn't, I don't know. I think we need, we need more of these in English. In search of the lost diminutive, suffix that croons over objects like babies, caressing them creating a verbal comfort zone, shrinking all threats, dressing pets up in doll clothes, serving demitas cups of dew, fairy food, no monsters, adults, or superpowers allowed. Slight. A slight implies, if not an insult, real or imagined, at least something unpleasant, a slight cold, a slight headache. No one ever says, you make me slightly happy. <laughs> Although this, in fact, is often the case. <laughs> Jail light. Forgotten spice on the tip of my tongue. The poverty of poetry the poetry of pouring in. Spontaneous generation. I was thinking of, um, you know, differences between old and young people, but I was also thinking of the scientific idea that you could create life from inanimate objects, which I kind of believe you can do. Luminous flank cut from darkness floating free as a new century, where the young are implacable and the old are crazy and do as they please. How did a silent movie give birth to a nation? How did a mouse, a shirt, and a few grains of wheat grow up to be the president? The dark age of summer the days are long and dull and perilously bright as I stroll the leafy corridor of the academy. Here, a near nude body flexes his dumbbells. There, a Samson upholds the twin pillars of chocolate and vanilla ice cream. No one but one has ever been outside in the cool air and lived to tell the story of our shadows parading before the garage door with tongs and fly swatters. We have no memory of times past or an otherwise world, lush and verdant, uncontaminated by ideas of any kind. Games of medieval sadness. This is in three parts. One, she visits a zoo 
where clocks are caged, and one hears the occasional oceanic roar of time. But more often, it's the tickle of quietly ticking breath. Stupefied, the alarmist cuckoo and towering grandfather giraffe stare, unable to leave their century. Moment reduced so small, they but vaguely remember the wilds of infinity. Life passes in what feels like a second, since each second can only be one lifetime long. Two, you live in a castle of cake. Your one weapon, your one possession, your only weapon, a fork. Clearly, you must eat the rich. Swallow the decadent ganache of their fantasies while continually and assiduously nursing the memory of a single bitter leaf. Three, they have a dungeon with my name on it. When I wish to be chastised, I need only log in and enter the type of pain. Physical, psychological, shame, remorse, guilt, along with the desired degree of intensity. My password is please. <laughs> My safe word is, wow, this is fun. <laughs> My reminder question is, what is your favorite novel? My favorite novel is not Crime and Punishment. My favorite novel is Madame Bovary. In black and white. X-ray of a day's bones and teeth. Blonde flowers, black water, shadows at play. Hot jazz and cool jazz, dominoes and dice, spades and clubs, but not diamonds or hearts, unless gray diamonds, gray hearts. The inner silver being that likes wandering the inside out underworld of B movies and silent movies, their quiet sister. There is nothing so clean and polished or dirty as black and white. Typography of the logos, original sin. The Garden of Eden was black and white. The color added later. Repetition and duration. <clears throat> Something lasts as long as it's repeated, as long as it's repeated as long. One works harder at first to make it last, noticing less and less in the middle until small differences come out like stars. The more often it is said, thought, done, the more there it becomes, solid, transparent, an echo, not a voice, a given, not a choice. The more there is, the less we need to. Loaves and fishes. <clears throat> How many times must I eat this salmon, drink this wine, in order for it to be real? really part of me, a meal consumed by not only the body, but by the candlelight of memory. This is called, do you think a photocopy of a snowflake is more beautiful than the original? Which is a line by Joanna Furman. Um, I taught her book pageant last semester. Many of you were in the workshop and read it, and um, she gave us this great assignment to, she typed up all the questions that are in all of her books, and she said we could write a poem answering um, one or more of the questions. So the one I chose is, do you think a photocopy of a snowflake is more beautiful than the original? And it's dedicated to Joanna. And there's a line of William Carlos Williams in it. Few know the gender of snow 
or can tell at a glance the menacing design at the storm center of its crystalline mind. But Williams, our dear doctor, speaks of the male snow which attacks and kills silently as it falls muffling the world. I'd like a meringue crisp snow under a thick blanket of synthetic bells. I'd like a menagerie of snowflakes running wild in a blank thicket of wind tunnels and glass air. Give someone a snowflake, like one note from a symphony, and what can it do? But a photocopy of a snowflake will hang forever in dazzling obscurity above a bed. These are um, a couple of poems about reading, reading at home to yourself. <laughs> a story begins. A story begins the same as other stories, but we follow along in case something different might happen. Just one different thing. It leads us to a ledge and pushes us over. Every story has a climax in a way Life doesn't. It puts us back where it, found, where it found us. It opens our eyes, which weren't closed, but felt that way because what we saw was happening inside the story. We are the excess of the story, that which it cannot contain, washed ashore. What was the story about? I can't remember. A dwindling, dim-witted tribe. Every month when the moon was full, they'd sacrifice another virgin, but could never figure out why the crops still wouldn't grow. Relay. I enter the book as one enters an old barn, long abandoned, standing and staring at words and parts of words floating upward in a shaft of light. I whistle as I read the almost silent precautionary whistling of one passing a graveyard of famous authors I admire but have no desire to be possessed by. I move freely speaking to this character, questioning that one. I'm no dumb reader. I myself am one of the characters. My fate is intertwined with theirs. We write the book amongst us as we go handing it off one to the next. Ode to distraction. Give me something not to pay attention to, and I'm happy. Some things grow better with neglect, spring up when the mind is elsewhere. A strange, wild flower that doesn't care for compliments. It is also good to be lost in some simple activity you have no interest in. Just as there is art for art's sake, why not a pure form of distraction? One says, I love you, to distraction, meaning in a way I can't stand to actually see or think of you. A date with an undertaker. He liked to bathe, dress, do their makeup himself, always brought flowers, made them sleep in a coffin, insisted on no talk or movement during sex. <laughs> Only their eyes could flutter open at the end when he gave the signal kiss. One young wanting to impress girl worked hard at playing dead by trying to spiritualize her thoughts. But an older one said she took a special pride in doing absolutely nothing, and that this was the kind of thing that couldn't be faked. The honeycomb of sleep. I sleep, you sleep, we all sleep. In every cell we try to speak, but fall quickly back to sleep between sentences. Throughout the hive, one hears only the busy signal of Zs doing their anti-work. 
the ones you meet on the way up. The itsy bitsy spider I killed returned to the exact same spot on the wall in my dream, only this time much bigger and hairier. Louder, too. Its thin voice lashed out at me, crisscrossing the room, instantaneously capturing the pale crumb of my head in its elaborate argument. It was speaking high spider, that ancient language of clipped grandiloquent tones. My shoes were crazy glued to the floor. My cries to him were as doggerel. Bardo Boulevard. I was thinking of the, the Buddhist between lifetime state, Bardo state, not Bridget Bardo Boulevard, which would also be a good poem. I might do that for next time. Um, a drowsy bucolic nostalgia for brood wideness, neon cows, a robot scarecrow in a magnetic field, early morning swarms of sunlight, creased, nattering, traffic in a maze. Come on, really, this is bullshit, <laughs> is the title. Behind the sighing, groaning, cursing, shackles, hot stove, backache, itch, sky-high wall of wanting to hide, vodka, waterfall, I see him smiling shyly, looking up out of his tall body as if he just told an invisible joke, whispered it telepathically, and was waiting to see if I would laugh. This is um, time time traveler's potlatch. So a potlatch is a gift-giving ceremony, and um, the surrealist made it into a, a game by adding time travel to it. So the way you play is you think of someone in another century, and you imagine <coughs> what gift you would send them. For Rousseau, a leopard of multicolored spots. For Edward Hopper, a perfect piece of lemon meringue pie in a diner at midnight where the only other customer is Greta Garbo reading a book. For John Cage, seven empty bird cages, each corresponding to a musical note. Some are elaborate Victorian wicker affairs, some of simple bamboo. For Nate Hawthorne, an electric train a board game based on the Salem Witch Trials, and a bottle of fine cherry. For T.S. Eliot, a crate of peaches with a note that reads, I dare you. <laughs> For Laura Riding, a dictionary and a whip. <laughs> Two more poems. Um, this next one's a little bit longer. That drives me crazy when people say two more poems, but the next one's 20 pages long. <laughs> no, this is only two pages. Um, it's inspired by a Beatles song. Um, I was reading this great biography of George Harrison, Here Comes the Sun. And I, I didn't realize, I, I noticed that a lot of my favorite Beatles songs actually were written by George, like Here Comes the Sun, um, If I Needed Someone. I think this one is my favorite. It's Blue Jay Way from Magical Mystery Tour. It's kind of a spooky sounding song. I won't sing it for you, but <laughs> it's like it, it, it's like there's a fog upon LA, and then at the end of every line, there's like this ghostly chorus, like, woo. <laughs> um, and the poem is dedicated to my fellow Beatle fan, Vincent Katz. Blue Jay Way. Like much great classic horror, it begins with fog. Fog and organ music. A melodic, malevolent fog has settled upon sunny, sharp-edged LA. Everything is under the spell of its lostness, its slow motion samsara. Even the unseen birds contribute to the tangle with their winding, gliding ways. The song itself is a spell, inducing us to turn left when we should go right. The singer's voice sounds distant and sleepy, jet-lagged and drugged. 
The singer and songwriter is George Harrison, who claims he was, in fact, jet-lagged when he wrote it while waiting for a friend late at night in a rented house on Blue Jay Way, a street high in the Hollywood Hills. We listen as if to a hypnotist, and our eyes, too, begin to grow heavy. We see ourselves from above, a bird's eye view, driving in the never arriving car, but also waiting back at the house. After the droning intonation of each line comes a chorus of wraiths and banshees wailing and rattling the chains of their distortion. There is actually a backward version of the entire mix, including vocals and all instruments faded up at the end of each phrase. The song is spooky, but like most of George's compositions, it can also be spiritual. The line, please don't be very long, repeated 29 times, could be addressed to a casual friend, a lover, or to God. I like the song, not so much because it encourages me to keep looking, but because thanks to its amazing technical wizardry, it perfectly replicates the muddled feeling of being lost. Truth be told, as someone born during a Mercury retrograde, I rather like being lost. <laughs> Even if you don't believe in astrology, I can assure you, I have virtually no sense of direction. Look at maps as a peculiar form of abstract art and often find that places I've been to many times look totally unfamiliar. It's the exact opposite of deja vu. <laughs> I like being lost for the same reason I used to like to smoke. It gives me an excuse, time to think, a way of being unaccountable, at least temporarily. In our age of GPS systems and cell phones, it's hard to imagine a song like this being written. The whole situation seems quaint. So why not succumb now and then, if only for nostalgia's sake, to the lure of the lost? Tomorrow is sure to be business as usual. And the last poem is called Dear Ovid. It's um, an anagram epithalamium. It's hard to say. So I wrote it for two friends who were getting married. And I thought, what would be more romantic than if the whole poem could only use letters of their names mixed together? And their names are Danny Rivera and Laura Modigliani. Yeah, lots to pick from. <laughs> Dear Ovid, divine lemon lime aria giving modern love a virile Roman air. I do dig your olive aura, your glide and glare. Give me your urn, and I'll lend you my lyre, my mad money any old day. Man, you are a golden raven. Damn, girl, you're my gamine on the Via de Amor. May I drive your demon, ride your river? May I die in your diner? among red vinyl and velour, and live raving on in your mural, an angel or lemur. Give me a nod and voila, I'm ready. Really, I am. Thank you so much. Thank you.